So I've been really excited listening to uh, all the different pastors uh, preach on this sermon series, Peace on Earth. It's been a really powerful series, and uh, there, there's nothing like the peace of God. There's nothing like it, and, and it's something that has kept me as a Christian. It's kept me grounded in my darkest and worst times in my life. It's been the peace of God that has truly, truly carried me. And uh, the, the scripture text for this is found in Luke chapter 2, verse 14. A little bit of context, we see that the shepherds are out there in the fields, just, you know, watching the sheep. And the Bible says, starting in verse 13, suddenly the angel uh, was joined by a vast host of others and the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased with. And we see here, when you read this um, chapter, you see that the angels are here to announce uh, the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we just celebrated that, right, this past Monday on Christmas. We celebrated the birth of Jesus Christ. And uh, in the book of Isaiah, he actually refers to Jesus as the Prince of Peace. And uh, this whole sermon series, you know, Peace on Earth, been really great. I would encourage you to watch all the other series um, or all the other sermons because they really contextualize um, what it means to peace on earth. And uh, last week, Manny did a great job talking about how we get the peace of God through peace with God, right? Very, very important. We get the peace of God when we have peace with God. And when we have that peace with God, the peace of we then become, God has then called us to be peacemakers. So with that peace, we are called to be peacemakers. And so that is what I want to talk to you guys about today. And that is uh, being a peacemaker. And I, I just titled this, Are You a Peacemaker? And I want you to take a minute, dig deep, and ask yourself, am I a peacemaker? You know, dig deep, think hard, close your eyes if you have to. Am I a peacemaker? If you ask your neighbor, like, hey, do you think I'm a peacemaker? What do you think they would say? Am I a peacemaker? Really dig deep. I pray right now that the Holy Spirit bring conviction, God, that it would just show us right now. This message is for everyone. We all struggle in this area. The title of this message, Are You a Peacemaker? And so I want to talk to you about the attributes of a peacemaker and why peacemakers are so important. So what is a peacemaker? All right, sounds very self-explanatory. Uh, peacemaker, someone who makes peace, right? Uh, just looking it up in the dictionary, it says a person who brings about peace to any situation. And so we probably all know a person, there's probably someone that comes to mind when I think of a peacemaker, someone that, you know, has just shown peace, right? Even when we've made mistakes, when, when life seems crazy, we know people like that that are peacemakers. And we also know people of the opposite, right? We know like, oh yeah, that person, not a peacemaker, right? We know what a peacemaker is. And uh, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, he says, uh, Jesus writes or says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. There's a special blessing that comes when we choose to be peacemakers. And I, I think it's very interesting that he says, uh, we will be called children of God, right? He doesn't say they will be children of God, but he says uh, they will be called children of God because uh, I believe it is the ability to be a peacemaker that makes people notice there's something different about you and they, it draws them back to Christ, right? The prince of peace. When people, when you work somewhere and you know someone that's just different, that's always just at peace, uh, maybe when work's chaotic, you know someone in your family that's always just at peace, you look and say, man, there's something different about them. And that is because they are a peacemaker. And the first thing I want to say is peacemakers draw others to God. Peacemakers draw others to God. And it's so important that we are peacemakers. So, so important. As Christians, you know, our goal is to uh, build one another up and push everyone to be uh, saved and encourage that, Right? And as peacemakers, that is what we're doing. We're drawing others to Christ. 
And you see, what's very interesting is the opposite applies for people who are non-peacemakers, right? They draw people away from Christ. Anyone ever, ever met someone like that? They may be saved, and, and they're just not a peacemaker. And you just think, like, man, like, are they even saved, right? Like, does that even add up? Very important that we, we live our lives as peacemakers because as Christians, the one thing we never want to do is draw people away from Christ. We always want to work to draw people towards Christ. And I know when, when I've experienced peacemakers here in this church, they have drawn me closer to Christ. I'm here today, I always say, because of people like you guys in this church. You guys have been peacemakers. You guys have just loved me. Uh, you've loved my family. And that is the reason, you know, I've continued to uh, stay grounded here in this church. Uh, the next thing peacemakers do is peacemakers strive to live in harmony with others. Say that word with me, harmony. Very, very important. Peacemakers strive to live in harmony with others. The Bible says in Psalms 133 verse 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. You guys ever been to maybe like a family party, family dinner, or even out with your friends, and you know that, uh, you know, someone's mad at each other, someone's beefing, and uh, you go there and there's kind of like, you could just sense it, like you could just sense it at the table, like, oh man, this is not, not good. And I, I understand completely what it's talking about because when there's a spirit of unity, when everyone's at peace with one another, you can have the best time of your life, right? Uh, this Christmas, I was just so blessed to be with my family and just have a really good time. Uh, no one was beefing, right? And uh, it was just a good and a pleasant time. Um, you know, I think of... Um, what we did for Winter Wonderland recently. I seen the harmony and the unity of us all coming together to put together this massive event. I seen people coming the day before, I seen people coming the day after, uh, everyone playing their part and working together in unity and how good and how pleasant it was for anyone who may have came for the first time and I pray that they were touched by all that, was takes, that takes place. And I want to commend you guys, the church, because you guys are the ones that made that happen. But we have to come together in harmony. The Bible says in Romans 12, verses 16 through 18, live in harmony with each other. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think that you know it all. How many of you guys ever feel like you know it all? It's like, man, I, I know it all. I got the answer right. And you probably know someone like that too. Like, oh, that person, they always think they know it all. But the Bible is very clear uh, that we got to do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. See, church, a peacemaker is humble. A peacemaker is very humble and just, you know, works harmonious with all different types of people. All different peoples of different ages different races, different personalities. We have to be in harmony uh, with one another as peacemakers. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Very, very important. Uh, the peacemaker looks past others' mistakes. The peacemaker looks past others' mistakes. And let me tell you, that is sometimes very hard uh, to do, especially when someone has personally offended you, uh, maybe someone you love, maybe a, a friend. Um, it's very hard to look past another person's mistakes. But we see uh, in the Bible, in the book of John, chapter 8, we see uh, the story of the immoral woman. And let me tell you this, if you are striving to be a peacemaker, you are struggling, I would encourage you to read about the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, Read his lifestyle, read about his decisions, read about the way he talked to people, and you will see that is the best example of a peacemaker uh, that you can get. Uh, and so what happens in chapter 8, he's preaching there at the temple, and the Bible says, and starting in verse 3, uh, as he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. goes on to say, they put her in front of the crowd, and let me stop right there. I, I think there's so much to unpack just in these first two sentences. Um, you know, I think of the religious leaders and the Pharisees. I would hope uh, that they were striving to be peacemakers, right? Uh, but when I look at this, I, I really contemplate and wonder, 
Um, you know, what were they really striving to do here? Were they really striving for peace? Because the Bible says they all came together and they gathered this woman in front of the crowd. And you see, too many times, church, we as believers, we, you know, someone's made a mistake and we all gather everyone together. Let me grab all these different people and let's discuss what's going on and let's pull this person aside and let's confront them, right? What were their intentions for this? I just find that very, uh, very interesting, right? And so they come to Jesus and say, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her, and what do you say? Right? And I think of this, and I think, you know, they came uh, with the intentions to stone her. They didn't come with the intentions to be peacemakers. They didn't come to help better her, help encourage her. Um, you know, but they came with the intentions essentially to kill her. And I could imagine that, you know, these people came together. They probably already had stones ready, right? They came ready to stone this woman, you know, and the Bible says in verse 7, they kept demanding for an answer, and so Jesus stood up and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And see, church, as peacemakers, you know, we have to evaluate ourselves, right? Are we perfect? No, have we made mistakes? You know, put ourselves in their shoes, you know? And it's very important that we, we learn to keep our mouth shut, right? It's tough. It's tough. It's tough. It's tough. And sometimes we want to just go off on people. But the peacemaker, you know, holds his tongue. The peacemaker prays about it. The peacemaker seeks counsel about it. You know, if someone's offended you, man, talk to your pastors. Let them know, hey, pastor, this took place. Um, I want to get your thoughts. What do you, how do you think I should move forward? Talk to... Um, Talk to a close friend, a close godly friend, and ultimately talk to the Lord about it, right? And I think, you know, these people came with the intention to kill this woman. And too many times, people as Christians, uh, we come with bad intent when we want to talk to people, right? We come with stones already ready to be thrown rather than coming to be a peacemaker. Some of you guys might be here in church right now with stones in your pocket ready to be thrown, right? You're just ready, like, man, if that brother comes up to me, I'm going to let him know I got my stone ready, and I'm just going to hit him with all, all I got, you know. I saw what you did the other day, da, 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 you know. And, you know, Jesus wasn't prepared like that. Jesus told everyone, hey, man, you know, let the one who's never sinned throw the first stone. We got to stop gossiping, stop carrying the stones, stop, stop coming ready to attack. And the Bible says in, in verse 11, uh, you know, the thing that's crazy is he doesn't, he ultimately condemns the sin, right? He says, go and sin no more, right? Simple as that. You know, he didn't, you know, throw the stone. He didn't, you know, let her have it. He just said, go and sin no more. And, and that's a true example of a peacemaker, right? Why beat a dead horse? She was already getting beat probably by all those people there. And I just think as peacemakers, we have to be more mindful of the way we talk to people, we have to be more mindful of our approach, um, especially when someone, you know, has made a mistake, right? We have to, obviously, we cannot allow or condone the mistake, uh, but there's a way to go about things in love. Drop the stone, church. That is you today. Drop it. Let it go. Peacemakers are able to forgive. See, we cannot be a peacemaker if we have malice, bitterness, or unforgiveness in our heart. It just, it just doesn't coincide uh, and I find it very interesting when uh, the Bible talks about in the Beatitudes in verse, Matthew 5, verse 9, he says, blessed are the peacemakers. The scripture right before that in verse 8 says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And I believe it's no accident that the Bible talks about the pure in heart before it talks about the peacemaker. Because I believe to be a peacemaker, you have to be pure in heart. Very, very, very important. The Bible says in Matthew 12, verse 34, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And let me tell you, if you have bitterness, unforgiveness in your heart, I'm going to say it's almost going to be impossible to be a peacemaker because out of the heart, the mouth speaketh, right? The unforgiveness is just going to come out. The, the hatred, the malice, the bitterness, it's just going to come out. It's even going to come out to people you love. It's like you're, you're, you're mad at someone else and you're just taking that out on other people. We have to forgive. And we see, ooh, let's see, sorry, I lost my place on this. 
And we see a great example of the Prince of Peace, Jesus, forgiving the people who crucified him. This man was beaten. He was bruised by the people who were just praising him a few weeks ago, right? He was walking on a donkey, and people were saying, Hosanna in the highest, worshiping him. And then a couple weeks later, you see him getting killed and crucified. But on the cross, he says something very, very important. In, cha- in Luke chapter 23, verses 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Imagine if we had that mindset, right? Imagine if we just, you know, when people are, are hurting us, when people are disrespecting us, we just said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Right? The best example of, the, of being a peacemaker was Jesus Christ. Being treated the worst ever, right? But he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Church, we have to forgive. We have to let go, and we have to move on. So very important. The peacemaker reconciles broken relationships. The peacemaker reconciles. It's one thing to forgive. It's another thing to reconcile, right? And we, I was reading the uh, story of Joseph. I'm sure you guys, uh, many of you guys know that, found uh, in the book of Genesis. It was like starting around chapter 40. A little context to the story is Joseph was, um, the Bible describes him as the favored son. And what ends up happening, his brothers get very jealous, and they sell him into slavery. Uh, so he gets sold at Egypt, uh, and then after that, he gets falsely accused of something and is imprisoned. And uh, just from doing some research, they believe he was in prison for 10 to 12 years. And so you can imagine how frustrating that is. One, to be sold into slavery. Uh, two, then to be in prison for 10 to 12 years. Uh, but God had a plan for all of this. And when you continue to read the story, you see that uh, Joseph ended up making his way through Egypt and working himself up to second in command. And what happens is there's a great famine that takes place. And his family ends up coming, or his brothers specifically, end up coming back to, coming to Egypt, not knowing that he was even alive, uh, and asking to buy some food in Egypt. And what happens is, is Joseph sees his brothers, and he can't contain himself. He's so uh, distraught. He's crying. I mean, you can imagine what was going through his head. And the Bible says that he brings his brothers to a back room. And the Bible says in uh, 45, in Genesis chapter 45, verses 45, a Joseph then lets him know that uh, who he was. And the brothers were all shocked. And it goes on to say, uh, Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And he said, And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. And I just trip out on his perspective on the way he handled this situation. He could have easily, as second in command in Egypt, had all his brothers wiped out. The moment he seen them, said, hey, you know what? Wipe these guys out. These guys did a lot of, they're probably still up to no good. They did a lot of bad things. Let's just get rid of them, right? But what Joseph did is he reconciled. He talked to his brothers, and the Bible says that they weeped. They weeped. He constantly, if you read that whole chapter, it talks about him weeping and his brothers weeping, and they reconciled. And, and the Bible talks about you know, him forgiving them, and he offers them to come move into the land of Egypt. And I really trip out on this because, you know, many of us probably would have said, I don't ever want to see my brothers again, right? That's just the flesh speaking. Like, I can imagine if I was in prison for 12 years, you know, I don't know if I would really want to talk to any of those people that imprisoned me, right? Just being honest. But I, I trip out on this because, I think Joseph didn't let his brothers uh, stop him from his relationship with his dad. Uh, I think that's very important because uh, sometimes as Christians, you know, we lose opportunities and we even break off relationships uh, because of uh, fallouts that we have with other people. And uh, it's very unfortunate uh, that that takes place. But Joseph reconciled with his brothers, which allowed him to bring in his whole family into Egypt, allow him to see his dad again and reconcile essentially the whole family. But you could imagine, say he had went, you know, with the flesh and just wiped out his brothers, he probably would have never seen his dad again. 
But see, Joseph understood the importance of reconciliation. He understood that if he was to bring his family in and save him, save them, he was going to have to reconcile with his brothers. He had to push the past behind him, forgive, let go, and move on. Joseph was a pure example of a peacemaker. He was done wrong completely, 100%. But he came in and brought peace to the family and ultimately saved them by bringing them back into Egypt. Peacemakers reconcile, even when it's tough, even when you've been done wrong. The peacemakers reconcile. You know, as peacemakers, you know, it's very tough. It's very difficult. You know, the calling to be a peacemaker is, is, I would venture to say it's impossible without God. It's just impossible. I, I can't do it on my own. You know, you can't do it on your own. But see, as a peacemaker, uh, we have to know where our strength comes from. See, the peacemaker understands where their strength comes from. It comes from God, right? And the Bible says it, uh, we read the story of David in uh, Psalms chapter uh, 120 in verses uh, 6 through 7. Uh, king David had been winning all these battles for the Israelites. And uh, King Saul had gotten very upset with him. And he essentially tried to kill him. So David was on the run, um, and he was in hiding in foreign lands. And the Bible says in uh, Psalms chapter 120, verses 6, he, he's writing a poem, and he says, And I'm tired of living among people who hate peace. Anyone ever felt like that? You're living among people who just hate peace? Maybe it's a family member, someone in the household, maybe it's a friend, someone at your job, someone at your school. And he goes on to say, I search for peace. But when I speak of peace, they want war. Man, they want war. You guys feel like that? You're just trying to live right. You're just trying to come to church, trying to serve God, and even the people in church want war. It's like, man, I'm just trying to serve God. I'm just trying to go forward. I'm just trying to do what God has called me to do, and everyone's just coming against me. But you know, what a crazy change of perspective when you go to the next chapter in, in uh, chapter 121. Starting with verse 1, he goes on to say, I look up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. What a a change in emotion, right? We see him earlier saying, you know, I'm striving for peace and everyone's coming against me. But see, he understood that his help comes from the Lord. The Lord who made heaven and earth, he will not let me stumble. The Lord that made heaven and earth will not let me stumble. And you know, I believe his understanding of where his strength came from allowed him to continue to push forward. Even when it felt like everyone was coming against him. Even when he was at war with all these different nations, he continued to push forward because he understood where his strength came from. His strength came from the Lord. And if you continue through that chapter in verse eight, he says, the Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and you go both now and forever. Can we just thank God, man? What an amazing scripture. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God. Thank you for looking after us, Lord God, for watching every place we go, God, for not allowing us to stumble. See, church, he understood where his help comes from. And, you know, I I really love this church because every service we have the opportunity to open the altars and come and talk to God. And if I could encourage you, take advantage of those opportunities. You may feel you're at war. You may feel like you're hurting. You may feel like your life is just falling apart. And these are the times when you need to come. You need to hit the altar and know where your strength's going to come from. I can't tell you how many times I've had to come and talk to God and let him know how I feel and just cry it out. I'm just going to be honest with you. And just leave it here. Tell God, I don't like this. I don't like that. Why is my life like this? You know, and just leave it in his hands. And let me tell you, in those moments, that's when I felt the peace that surpasses all understanding. That's when I found myself being able just to be a peacemaker, even when it was so hard. I'm like, God, how am I even doing this? But it wasn't me. It was God. God was just, man, doing something supernatural in me. The peacemaker knows where their strength comes from. The peacemakers know where their strength comes from. You know, you got to talk to God. Uh, Isaiah refers to Jesus as the wonderful counselor. 
Don't get me wrong. Talk to your friends. Talk to your spouse. Talk to your pastor. Talk to your, man, your counselor, your therapist. But there is nothing like the wonderful counselor. No one will be able to take his place. No one. Jesus is the wonderful counselor. You need to take it to him first. The peacemaker knows where his strength comes from. And the peacemaker ultimately changes the lives of others. See, the peacemaker, it could even be contagious, right? Has anyone ever been there where, like, you know, someone just does something so nice for you and then you just want to return the favor or you want to be so nice to someone else? Uh, I, I can't help but think of, uh, have you ever been through a drive through and then they say, like, the person in front of you paid for your order and you're like, oh, man, like, oh, I'll pay for the person behind me. Um, when I used to work at Chick-fil-A, you would see cars do that. And I, I've seen it go like 10 to 12 people. And I would, I would trip out on that because the peacemaker, uh, showing peace to one another, it becomes uh, contagious and uh, it ultimately changes the lives of others. See, Jesus brought peace to the world. The Bible says in John 16, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. And see, Jesus came to bring peace. And uh, the Apostle Paul talks about us being imitators of Christ. And I, I think it's so important as we're imitators of Christ, we too should come to try to bring peace to this world. That should be our goal. We should be cut above. We should be the peacemaker. We should not be the person that you see arguing, you know, at the supermarket, arguing over a parking space, right? You look at that person, you're like, oh, man, they are not a peacemaker, right? But we need to be imitators of Christ. And, and we need to understand that he was the prince of peace. There is no better example than him. We're going to have trials, church. We're going to have tribulation. But we still need to strive to be peacekeepers. Jesus was crucified, and he was the biggest peacekeeper of them all. I always remember that. Jesus came to bring peace to the world, and yet he was still crucified. It's going to be tough at times, but we got to continue uh, just to strive to be a peacemaker. So ask yourself, are you a peacemaker? You know, evaluate yourself and think through, man. Am I a peacemaker? Am I a peacemaker? If we could all just bow our heads now. We prepare to close in prayer. You know, tonight we talked about being a peacemaker. And we asked the question, you know, are you a peacemaker? You know, to be a peacemaker, we have to be first at peace with God. And so today, if there's anyone here who says, you know what, I'm not at peace with God, I'm not serving God, I know I am not a peacemaker. I know that if I, you know, pass away tonight, that I know that I'm not making it to heaven. We want to pray with you and let you know that Jesus loves you. You know, the great thing about Jesus, like I said, he's a peacemaker. He's a gentleman. He doesn't force himself upon you. He waits for you to make the decision to be at peace with him. And he's there with the door open, just waiting. And so if that is you today, you want that peace of God, you want that peace that surpasses all understanding. If you could just lift your hand so we can pray with you. If that is you today, you know you're not serving God. We want to just pray with you. Christians, if you're just praying for anyone who may not be saved today. You know that you're not a peacemaker. You know that you're not at peace with God. Raise your hand and let us pray with you. Heavenly Father, have your way. Breathe your breath of life. Holy Spirit, come and bring conviction, God. Move supernaturally. And if we could all just stand to our feet today.